So today, today I wanted to talk about a Lobster, which is a new package that I've been working on as part of the second edition of Advanced R. So one of the, the big changes in this next edition is there's a bunch more diagrams, because I think they really help you understand what's going on with R. And of course, in the, in the book, there's like a bunch of like diagrams that I spend like hours drawing by hand, um, which are great for the stuff that's in the book, but then how do you go and then apply, how do you use those same ideas with your own code? So today, I'm going to show you some the tools of the Lobster. They're basically tools for creating command line visualizations of kind of interesting things in the R language, interesting and challenging things about the R language. So we're going to talk about three big ideas today. Uh, the distinction between names and values in R with the ref function. Uh, the fact that in R code, all R code, you can think of as a tree with the AST function. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the, sort of something I just recently came to understand about uh, tracebacks or call stacks in R and how they're not actually just a linear stack, they're actually a tree. And I think that's gonna have some profound implications for making more useful error messages in R. Now, Lobster is still only on GitHub, uh, but you know I am serious about it because it has a logo. <laughs> And just the, the logo hopefully makes it obvious that the inspiration for the name is these are kind of functions like the str function in base R. So str displays the structure of any R object in kind of a tree-like fashion. All of the functions in Lobster, or many of the functions in Lobster, try and do a, same, a similar thing, like create a little visualization, a little console tree that describes some kind of object in R. In most of all, at least for the first two topics, these correspond to chapters in the advanced R. I'll put these links up again at the end. But um, if you want to learn more about any of these topics, you can go and read the, the chapters in advanced R. But I'm going to start with a little quiz for you all. So I want you to run this R code in your head. I've run the first line. I've created a vector with a million random normal, of random uniforms, and I've found out its size, which is about eight megabytes. So what I want you to do now is run the rest of the code in your head and uh, see what it outputs. And then like talk it over with your neighbor, see if you get, get the same answer or not. So you, you've got one minute to run this code starting now. Okay, time's up. So let's do just a quick show of hands. How many predicted that the answer for this was gonna be about 24 megabytes, say? And, and how many people thought, well, I think it probably is 24 megabytes, but if the answer was so simple, Hadley wouldn't have like, tried to trick me like this. Okay. So if we actually, let's, so let's run this code in R. And Jared told me it was extremely dangerous to run our code live in a talk, but I'm going to do it anyway. So just to verify this, a million random uniforms, that's a, a uniform in R is a double. A double takes up eight bytes, so we've got a million of them, so it's about eight million bytes, plus a little bit, which I'm not going to talk about today. And actually, we're, no, we're not going to run that. Uh, oh, I guess so. I'm going to copy and paste. If I run this... It's actually just, it's still eight megabytes and a little bit. And we'll see why that is very shortly. And then what happens if I modify one of the values in that list? Well now all of a sudden it's now 16 megabytes. So what the heck is going on here? <laughs> it's easiest to understand with some pictures and to kind of understand what the assignment arrow is actually doing. The assignment arrow is not creating an object. The, the R unif function is creating the object. 
what the assignment arrow is doing is associating this object or this value with a name. And this is like a, in R, this is a, basically like a reference. It's kind of like a pointer. I'm not going to use pointer because that kind of conveys some like specific technical meaning, which is not true in R. But it's like a reference. A name references a value. And in fact, like many references can point to one object. So when you assign one object to another object, well, that's not really what you're doing, right? When you use the assignment arrow multiple times, you're actually just referencing the same value from multiple names. So now when you, if you've done this in R, like now you can kind of ask this question, well, how big is A? Well, A is going to be the same size as X, right? So it's about 8 megabytes. How big are A and B together? Well, kind of strangely, they're both 8 megabytes, right? So the size of two references in R, like the size of A and the size of B together, does not equal the size of A plus the size of B. So this kind of like non-transitivity makes reasoning about how big an object is in R quite challenging. And we can kind of verify that with some R code. So one thing the object object underscore size function, which comes from lobster does, you can give it multiple objects and it tells you the total size of those objects. So you can see A and B are individually 8 megabytes and they're also 8 megabytes together. Before I go on, should I make, can everyone read this code okay or do I need to make it a little bigger? Make it a little bigger? That's about, that's about as big as I can go and you can still actually see what I'm doing. Okay. So you can have multiple names pointing or referencing the same value. And that's also true of lists. So when you create a list, R does not copy all of the things into that list. It just references them where they lie. So now when we say, well, how big is X? Well, that's about 8 megabytes. How big is Y? That's also about 8 megabytes. So let's make that a little bit more precise. Hopefully, if I remember the order in this, what we're supposed to do this. So if we look at the size of y minus the size of x, we can see that's 72 bytes. And kind of interestingly, that's exactly the same size as a list, a list of three empty elements. So the size of that list is the size of x, plus the size of a list, and the size of a list is basically a, a bunch of pointers. And this kind of like, if you, like a pointer, you might happen to know is like eight bytes, and so three times eight is 20, okay, no, that's leading me wrong, that's leading me in a bad direction, because um, <laughs> that's not gonna work out. I, uh, maybe that's right. Uh, let's go back to this, oops. You'll, you'll notice there's like a little bit of overhead on our objects because they have to store some kind of other information, which is about 40 bytes. And I can't remember exactly why it's not ending up 40 bytes there. Okay, so we also have another tool. Oops, let's just rerun this. So, you know, you don't have me to draw all these diagrams for you by hand when you're trying to understand what's going on with your objects. So Lobster comes with this ref function. And what a ref attempts to do is tell you like the structure of your object and how it like references other objects. So we can see here we have a list and each object in R has this kind of, each value in R has this sort of identifier, this address. And this is basically where that object lives in memory, which is, doesn't really mean anything because every time you start R, it's going to occupy a different part of memory on your computer. But within a session, this allows us to kind of identify a, a value rather than a name. And so we can see here, we have this list. Its name, its, its address is, I'm not going to say the whole thing, but it's 0x7bf, etc. And then inside this list, we have a double which has this address, and then the other components of the list are just that same object repeated again. So you can see as well as the address, there's also this kind of local address. So you can see that this is the object two, and these other two elements of the list point back to that object. So what happens when you modify an object in the list? Well, in R, modifying an object creates a copy. 
So this sort of happens in two steps. So if I'm going to modify the first element of y, well, first of all, r is going to create the x modified to with the first value changed. And then it's basically going to change where this reference is. So now if we ask, like, how big is x? Well, x is still about 8 megabytes. This vector is about 8 megabytes. And so the size of y is going to be this vector plus this vector plus a little bit of a counting overhead. So it's going to be about 16 megabytes. And so what happens if we modify x? Well, the same thing's going to happen. R is going to create a new vector that is modified, and then it's going to change where x points to. So kind of all the time, like whenever you think, almost always whenever you think you're modifying something in R, you're actually modifying a copy, with one little exception, which I'll, I'll get to shortly. Now what happens when you, if you want to remove these objects? Well, in R, you can call Rm. And what rm does is removes the names. It removes the references to those values. rm doesn't actually delete the object or the values themselves. So that's the job of the garbage collector. And what the garbage collector does is every so often, like either when you need more memory or just every so many kind of vector creations, r is going to go through and look for all of the objects that have no references pointing to them, and it's going to clear them out so you can use that memory again. So in this case, it's going to look through, it's going to find, well, there's two objects that nothing points to, this vector at the top and this list down the bottom, and it's going to delete those, and then it's going to realize, well, oh, now there's two new vectors that don't have anything pointing to them, and it's going to get rid of those as well. So when you remove an object in R, it happens in two passes. First, you remove the, remove the references, and then later on, kind of stochastically, the garbage collector is going to come along and actually delete those objects and free up the memory for you. But there's kind of one exception to this rule, because if every time you modified an object in R, it created a copy, R would be like incredibly slow. Like R is not like a fast language as it is. Um, but if I had to create a new vector, copy every single time you modify something it would be astronomically slow. So like if, if you had a vector like this and you modified it and you modified it again, right, you end up with, you'd end up with three copies of that vector. So R has this optimization so that if it knows that the vector only has one name, it only has one reference pointing to it, it will modify it in place. So this kind of keeps the performance of R at like sort of a reasonable level. It, it has a special optimization because if only one thing is pointing to an object, like it doesn't really matter if you modify it in place. From the outside view, outside world, it's exactly the same as if you had created a copy and then changed the reference to it, because there's only that one reference. And we can kind of, one way to do that in R, uh, to see what's going on, uh, which I'm going to briefly do something crazy, and I'm going to use the terminal pane in R Studio. And I am going to run R inside of that for a reason which I'm going to explain shortly. Now this is like a little bit, a little bit this is a little bit insane. And you can do some, there's this really old uh, DevTools function called DevTools, what did they call it? They call it bash? Uh, oh, that's, oh, I'm not inside of a package, that's sad. Uh, but you can actually use DevTools to call bash, which will open a bash shell inside this, and you can call R inside that, and it gets very confusing. <laughs> actually, I think you can just do this. Uh, is this going to work? Yeah, so now I'm running bash. I'm running R inside R Studio's terminal. Inside that, I'm running bash. And then inside that, I can run R. <laughs> that's, that's a really bad idea, though, so I'm not going to do that. OK, so I'm back in R. I'm going to create a vector. I'm going to call trace mem. And what this does is it just prints out the address of that object. And now, whenever that object gets copied, it is going to print out something like this that that object just got copied. Oops, and I accidentally used the wrong keyboard shortcut, so I'm going to run this in my R terminal. And you see, when I'm modifying that vector, no copies are occurring, because there's only one thing pointing to it. If I did this, oh, so I'm going to keep using the wrong keyboard shortcut. If I did this, there's now, two ob there's now two names pointing to that same vector. If I change it, it's going to have to create a copy. And it only has to do that once 
right? Because now there is only one thing pointing to that new object. Now, unfortunately, if you run the same code in our studio, you will get confused. Because it looks like when you're modifying it, it's actually creating a copy. Well, it is actually creating a copy. And that's because of one really helpful feature in our studio, which is the environment pane. And so the environment pane creates like another reference to this object. So that when you're experimenting with this interactively in our studio, it's always going to create a copy. Now, you might wonder, like, is this going to make our studio make all of my code catastrophically slow? Um, no, because most of the time you're not like doing a bunch of modifications at the top level that's inside a function or inside a for loop and our studio doesn't see that object. It doesn't put in the environment pane, so it's not a, it's not a big deal. Okay, so TraceMem allows you to see whenever an object gets copied, and because of the rules for like when, so the, this is all, this, this seems straightforward, but the big complication is that when R is kind of counting how many references are pointing to an object, it can only count up to, to two, basically. So it knows if there are zero references, one reference, or if there are many references. So that means if you have like three references to an object and you delete two of them, R cannot kind of figure out that there's only one left. So maybe that, that might happen in a future version of R. But that basically means like it's very difficult for you to predict when a copy will occur or not. So if you're ever wondering, if you're ever trying to optimize performance at this level, like use TraceMem, don't try and think it through, just see exactly what happens. Okay, so that's kind of the first big idea that there's an, in R, there's this really important distinction between names and values. You might think that assignment or calling a function is going to copy your vector. That's not going to be the case. The objects in R are only copied when you modify them. The next thing I want to talk about is this kind of powerful idea that makes it really easy to write R code that writes R code. And that's this idea that in R, all code is a tree. And what do I mean by that? I mean, basically, you can draw any R expression in a tree like this. I'm going to draw this function call as an orange square. And then the first child is the name of the function that's called. And then the subsequent, cho the subsequent children are the arguments to that function, x, the letter y, and the number 1. And no matter how complicated your R code is, you can always draw it in this form as this tree-like structure. There's one little wrinkle, though, because here I've drawn this. This is kind of the, the type of code you call with the functions that you have written in R. This is called a prefix function call because the name of the function comes first before its arguments. But there are other function calls in R that, are not, that do not look like that. So a very common class of those calls are called infix function calls where the name of the function comes in between its arguments. So two two commonly used functions that are infix functions, the assignment arrow, the thing that's being assigned to is on the left, the, the value that's being assigned is on the right, and multiplication. Like the, this is the multiplication function comes in between its arguments. And it turns out in R you can rewrite any function call in R no matter how weird it looks in this prefix form where the name of the function comes first. Now, if the name of the function is something weird, like assignment arrow or multiplication, you have to put it in between backticks. But you can rewrite any R expression in this way. And so again, you can just read this tree like we did before. We've got two function calls. The first function call is the assignment arrow. It's going to assign the reference y to the value, which is the result of computing x times y. So let's have a look at that. So just like with ref, The, the first example, there is a function in Lobster which helps you draw these diagrams called AST. It's called AST because in computer science, the name for these trees are, is abstract syntax trees. Now, every single programming language has an abstract syntax tree, but it's unusual in the cross-programming languages to be able to access that tree directly. But you can in R, which makes it pretty neat. So here I'm just going to show you the, the AST output for that first function, and it just tries to 
tries to draw that tree as closely as it can on the console. You can see that orange square is the function call. The first argument is the function being, the first child is the function being called. Then we have the arguments x, the letter y, and the number one. And no matter how complicated that gets, let's make it a little bit more complicated. Oops. No, I've got too many parentheses. It'll just it'll draw that tree for you. And it'll also draw it for you, you know, even if when, you, when you've got expressions that do not immediately look like they're in this form, that the way the name of the function is not the first thing. So this kind of allows us to like dig in a little bit to the how R's grammar works. So like when you add two numbers together, the, 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 the plus function takes two arguments. So there's kind of two ways that R might interpret this, right? It could do one plus two and then add on three, or it could do one plus two plus three. And now this doesn't matter most of the time, right? Because it doesn't matter for addition, it doesn't matter which order you do it in, but this is like really important for packages where addition no longer has this property. So for example, in ggplot2 we use plus, the order in which you do the addition is actually really important. And there's one reason why the plus is not a great fit for ggplot2. That's a different question. <laughs> That's a different talk. Uh, so when we, when we print, print this with AST, you can see there's a function called a plus. The first argument to that is another called a plus, which is one plus two. So this is, uh, the, the way you describe this is R is left associative because it does the things on the left first. The only exception to that is like exponentiation, which is right associative. It does the things on the right first. And that allows us to see kind of other quirks of the R, like if you do not X and Y, that is not going to do not X and then see if that's in Y. It's going to do is X and Y and then take the opposite of that. This, I think, is kind of one reason that there isn't like a, a built-in, like some people like want a, a not in, I guess you could, uh, I don't know how you'd write it. Some people do something like this. Well, then you just write it like this, not X and Y. <laughs> Seems kind of pointless. It also allows us to see, to dig into like other things in, in R that look even less like function calls and multiplication and assignment. Like, so what about an if statement? How is that a function? Well, we can ask AST to draw that and it turns out the if called a if is a function with three arguments. The first argument is the condition. The second argument is what to return if the condition is true. And the third argument is what to return if the condition is false. Or well, similarly, like what are the arguments to the for function? Well, the arguments to the for function are the name of the thing that you're indexing over, the, the value of the thing that you're indexing over, and then the body of the for loop. Or like what is the function function? What does that do? Well, the function function is a function with three arguments. So the first argument uh, is the arguments to the function, the second argument is the body of the function, and the third argument is the source ref uh, which is the, the text of the function, and that's what enables you when you print out a function, you see the, all the comments and stuff inside the function. Those are not normally captured by the abstract syntax tree because they're not syntax. That's just human readable stuff. The AST just captures stuff that R cares about. So, so why should you care about this? Um, I think one reason is this is an important part of tidy evaluation. So tidy evaluation is a toolkit that allows you to program with uh, packages like ggplot2 and dplyr, and it's powered by the Arlang function, or Arlang package. One of the cool functions in the Arlang package is this expra, pack, expra function. What that does is it basically captures what you give it. It just returns exactly the code that you gave it. But it also supports unquoting with this crazy bang bang operator. So the bang bang is called the unquoting operator. It's pronounced bang bang, obviously, as I've just said like five times now. But what it does is it's easiest to see when, once you understand that code is a tree, it's really easy to draw what bang bang does. So what bang bang does is we have one code tree here and one code tree here. The bang bang kind of defines like a hole which we just insert that other tree into. 
So Bang Bang allows us to build up complex trees from simple pieces. So I've explained that very, very quickly, and now I'm going to give you all a challenge to see if you can run this R code in your head. So see if you can figure out, predict what this is going to return based on that extremely quick uh, description. You have one minute, starting now. Okay, time's up. So what is this first call going to return? It's just going to be x plus y, right? Because x just captures what you gave it. What about the second one? It should be pretty easy too, hopefully, right? x plus y plus z, you've combined that first expression with the second one. What about the last one? This is a little challenging, right? Because it could return 1 over x, 1 over x plus y, or 1 over x x plus y, right? That's hard to say, it's easier to show. Um, but it does actually return the second one. Because we're dealing with these trees, those parentheses kind of get inserted automatically and, and, and correctly. And this is kind of one of the reasons why I think thinking about trees when you're creating code in this way, it's much better than thinking about strings and pasting strings together uh, like an animal because... <laughs> It preserves this important tree-like structure of the code. So that's another important aspect of R. Like you can represent all code as a tree. And the thing that makes that every language does that, the thing that makes R special is you can actually like capture that tree. It's a first class type of object in R. You can capture that tree and you can work with it. And that's what powers, like that's what allows dplyr to take your R code and translate that into SQL because inside dbplyr it actually like computes on the tree of R code and translates that to something else. This is sort of, to me, like one of the reasons, like it doesn't actually matter that R is kind of relatively slow compared to other programming languages because R doesn't have to be fast. It just makes friends with other environments and you can easily translate R code to those other environments. The one last thing I wanted to talk about is something I only discovered very recently, um, which is this idea that call stacks or tracebacks are not actually stacks, they're actually trees. So the kind of motivation is sort of like, is this basically. So I've created some function, uh, some vectorized function that I'm going to use with ggplot2, and like deep in the bowels of that function, there's an error. And now when I use this inside ggplot2, and I print out the traceback, it's kind of hard to see like where my code is and where ggplot2 code is. Like it's hard to see like where is the, where is the source of that problem. Like the, the bit I actually care about is kind of like my code. There's f called g called h and then that caused an error. Now I kind of wanted to show you like what that would look like with my proposed tools but unfortunately it just, this revealed a bug in the way that works. So we're going to kind of work our way up. Um, with some simpler examples. So it Lobster provides the CST function that stands for call stack tree, basically. And so this is kind of equivalent to traceback, but what it's going to do is it's going to display uh, this in a tree-like way. And for a simple function call like this, you know, f calls g, g calls h, h calls the CST function, you just see that as like a, a tree with one set of one branch, basically. Every, every tree only has one child. So when, there's, when, for, when everything is eagerly evaluated, 
it, it's really simple. Things get more complicated when you start using functions that kind of with where lazy evaluation comes in. So I'm going to use the identity function before I will claim I think the identity function is the simplest function in base R. You give it an argument x and it simply returns that argument. Right? There's, there's nothing, well, there's almost nothing simpler that a function could do. But what this is, what this is going to cause is this, this is going to be like lazily evaluated, right? Because in R, function arguments are only evaluated when they're, when they're needed. In which case, in this case, it's needed right away, but it adds some kind of complication to that call stack tree. So I'm going to call identity, identity f, and see what happens. And now we actually get this tree-like structure. So we see identity calls. And the evaluation of this is only kind of going to be triggered inside this function. So we get a new branch, and then we see our code at the end. And like when you start mixing like tries into the, putting tries in the mix, things start to get more and more complicated. And if you've ever tried to debug code that's inside a try catch, you'll have noticed like the traceback includes all of these weird parts, these, these details about how try catch is implemented that you are not, you do not actually care about because they're not in your code. And this tree-like structure makes it very easy to say, well, the, the thing that you're actually interested in is always like the terminal branch of this tree. And so my hope is like with this understanding, uh, this will allow us to make much, much simpler uh, call stack, much, much more useful traceback messages in our studio and in the tidyverse. And I wanted to kind of like one, illustrate like one extreme uh, aspect of that. And this is a, uh, tr a, a call stack generated from inside Shiny, um, which, so if you've ever tried to debug like Shiny code, Shiny, it's, code is challenging to debug because your code is embedded in this much bigger framework for like handling when your code should be evaluated. And if you like look at the full traceback, and this is drawn as a tree which makes it even, which makes it like at least feasible to understand, but you'll see like it's quite complicated, right? Like if there's like, we're still like going, this still isn't even at my, my code yet. And we're still going. And this is actually the bit that you care about. Like inside the render, the render plot you've called, there's the stop function, there's this error. That's, that's, this bit is what you actually care about. This is the bit of your code that is important, not the rest of the Shiny's infrastructure to run your code. And that's really, when you're just looking at the stack trace linearly, it's really hard to identify that this is, a, this is the important bit. But it turns out, like, once you display it as a tree and think about it as a tree, it's, like, really easy to say now, well, in this case, it's kind of the second branch, it's the second terminal branch from the end. And we can, well, hopefully, in a future version of Shiny, we'll, like, drill down. And when you have an error message, you will see your error, the, your code that caused the error, not all of the infrastructure. Um, and Shiny has already done a bunch of work, which is this kind of stack trace on stuff, which to try and kind of make the stack trace a little bit more manageable, but this sort of realization that this, this stack trace is actually a tree, I think is going to help profoundly, like throughout the tidyverse, uh, throughout in our studio and Shiny, make error messages much, much, or the tracebacks more informative, so you can see exactly uh, where the problem lies, not what is all of the other code that's run your code that's eventually caused the error. So to sum up, um, I've kind of shown you, oh, that's a terrible, oops, I've shown you learn three by hours, let me fix that. I've shown you, okay. So I have shown you three big ideas. The, the previous title was, uh, you have learned three big ideas, but I thought that might be a little aggressive given that I just showed them to you very briefly. But I have definitely shown you three ideas. I'm not gonna make any assertions about whether you have understood them or learned them or not. But I think three big ideas Oh, and this is not even in the order in which I presented them, so I'm going to fix that too. You can see my process live here. I spent so much time lining these perfectly up. There we go. So three big ideas. The first big idea, I think, is the most important. That 
like if you can kind of separate the idea of names or references from objects or values, you will be able to build up a much more accurate mental model of like what operations are going to be expensive in your R code. And by and large, the things that are expensive are modifying objects, not passing them to functions or putting them in lists. So if you want to understand that in more detail, that, that's the ref function in Lobster, which prints out kind of the first time you see each value in an object in a list or a set of lists or set of objects, and then shows you that you're not actually um, copying things, you're just pointing to them or referencing them. The next big idea is, in that R, and is that all R code is a tree. So R code forms this thing called the abstract syntax tree, or AST for short. You can display that with the lobster AST function. And that is, I think, important to kind of understand that basic idea if you want to use tidy evaluation, because that's what allows you to safely insert your variable or your expression into big, more complicated expressions, preserving correct operator precedence and so on. It's also what allows me to create tools like dbplyr, which lets you translate R code to SQL code. And finally, I talked a little bit about this idea that call stacks are trees. Uh, I think that's going to be kind of like most important for like me and other developers at RStudio because we can use this to create uh, you know, better, more informative tracebacks when you hit an error. So altogether, I think these, th these three things are three things that make R a little bit different to other programming languages. There are very few other programming languages that, um, wow, well, there's, so some programming languages do make this distinction between names and values, and others do allow you to access code as a tree, and very few programming languages have lazy evaluation. But the combination of these three things, I think, like, makes R special to me. And that, that's like one of the things that I kind of like, I personally get a huge amount of satisfaction about learning this sort of stuff about the R language. And to me, like, you know, a lot of people look at R and they like, if they have experience with other programming languages, maybe like they throw up a little bit in their mouth. <laughs> um, because R is legitimately different to other programming languages. But to me, that, that difference is unambiguously a strength, not a weakness. And sure, many of these features do actually make R, like they kind of fundamentally li limit the computational performance of R. They mean that R is never going to be like as fast as Python or as fast as C++. But they also mean that that distinction is not actually that important. Like R is a language that is optimized for human performance, not computer performance. And when you are working with larger data sets, particularly the second feature is a huge strength because you just leave your data where it is. You leave data in a system that is designed specifically for working with large data sets in a high performance way, and then you write R code, and an R package translates your R code to whatever that other system understands. And so you get this seamless workflow where you can do very rapid exploration of in-memory data with R, and then when you need to scale up, you talk to some other specialized system. Thank you.